This program features the risk of Apollo 13, which was the third mission to attempt to land American astronauts on the moon. Neil Armstrong had landed during the Apollo 11 mission for the first time. The Apollo 12 mission was also a successful manned landing. But then came Apollo 13 in April of 1970. My role was warning system engineer for that mission. As such, I was on duty at the Manned Spacecraft Center the evening of April 13, 1970, when Apollo 13 exploded. But before continuing with the program, a brief video by the Christian Broadcasting Network of my explanation of Apollo 13 will help to explain the story which followed. An oxygen tank had exploded in the mothership. This is a model of the craft as they looked in those days in April of 1970. And as they traveled to the moon, it took two vehicles, the mothership on my right and the lunar lander on the left. An explosion of an oxygen tank in the mothership had disabled it. The only means of getting them back to Earth was to be the lunar lander, designed for two men for two days. But the trip back to Earth for three men would take four days. Our difficulty and dilemma was how to make this rescue ship last for the entire time that it would take to get back to Earth. It was on the watch of the 37th President of the United States, Richard Nixon, that the moon landings became reality and Apollo 13 occurred. That particular evening in April of 1970, things were routine. In fact, there was a sense of boredom. As I prepared to leave the Space Center and return to my home just several miles away. This study of the rescue began in earnest in February of 1972, about a year and a half after the mission. Showing are a small portion of those periodicals and technical manuals researched to tell the following account. Thousands of hours have been spent examining microfilm of newspaper accounts, interviewing participants in the rescue, simulating and reconstructing events on board Apollo 13. Likewise, events which occurred in mission control as well as the mission evaluation room have been examined as well. And this research continues even unto this day, and some of the most compelling discoveries have come just weeks ago. This is an ongoing examination of the miraculous rescue of Apollo 13 and new technologies not known to the days of Apollo assist in this study. Among these are the internet, uh, advances in animation and graphical modeling, as well as virtual reality, which all have contributed to recent discoveries. Here's a picture of the Apollo 13 original crew with Jim Lovell, the commander on the left, Ken Mattingly, in the center who was scrubbed because he was exposed to Charlie Duke's measles and then lunar module pilot Fred Hayes on the right. This is command module pilot Jack Swigert who replaced Ken Mattingly. Jack's substitution ap appears providential because Jack had practically written the malfunction procedures for the Apollo command module, the ship which exploded. Additionally, note how robust Jack appears compared to the slightly built Ken Mattingly in the previous picture. As a former University of Colorado football player, Jack's brawn was fortuitous in light of the deprivation of heat in store for the Apollo 13 crew. Indeed, Fred Hayes of slider, lighter build was sorely tested in these conditions. Fred contracted a fever and other complications due to the severe environment encountered during the rescue. Though Ken Manningly didn't pilot Apollo 13, Ken got a second chance. Later, 
he piloted the successful Apollo 16 mission to the moon. Here's how a Houston movie section featured Apollo 13, the movie. Certainly the events which are told in the following slides are riveting, they're exhilarating and altogether thrilling in a way no Hollywood space movie had ever portrayed them before. Billboards like this appeared throughout Houston announcing the coming of the movie Apollo 13. This particular marquee was seen on NASA Road 1 out the rear gate of the Space Center where much of the drama took place a quarter century before. In its location was only a stone's throw from the Timber Cove home of Apollo 13's commander Jim Lovell, a home I had visited a number of times because it had been purchased from the Lovells by an astronaut friend of mine in the late 1980s. I've always felt a special kinship to the movie Apollo 13 because of the way it was birthed. I shared the duties of Sunday School Superintendent with Flight Controller Jerry Bostick at the local Methodist Church, which many of the astronauts attended. Well, I had the 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning responsibility and Jerry served at 11 a.m. During that period, uh, long after the rescue though, Jerry and his wife attended a Bible study we conducted in our home. I recall Jerry's son Mike attending a Sunday school class I once taught. Mike went on to work for Ron Howard. It was Mike who suggested that Ron Howard make a movie about a Powell 13 based on Jim Lovell's book, Lost Moon. And though I contributed nothing to the movie, Jerry Bostick was one of the main technical advisors. He helped make the movie a very accurate portrayal of 1960s Apollo 13 mission technology. Years later, with the re-release of Apollo 13, the movie, as an IMAX film, I was designated by Grace Hill Media and Universal Studios as the national spokesman to the Christian media. Well, this included a number of national interviews with gospel and secular radio stations. Websites and daily radio broadcasts such as Billy Graham's Decision Today. Much of what I shared is included in this program. This is one of the interviews that appeared on an internet movie review site. And this is another of the interviews about the rescue of Apollo 13. The stars of the movie Apollo 13 are shown here, left to right. Kevin Bacon is Command Module Pilot Jack Swigert, Tom Hanks is Commander Jim Lovell, and Bill Paxton is Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes. I've used this life-size cardboard movie set to explain events in the rescue of the Apollo 13. Much has been made of Apollo 13 launching on the 13th minute of the 13th hour and exploding on the 13th day of the month. Whether you believe the mission was cursed or not, there is no question that prayer, faith, heroism, teamwork and ingenuity overcame all ill fortune, curses and bad luck during those four days of the rescue. A few seconds before 55 hours, 55 minutes into the mission, the explosion of the flawed oxygen tank was heard by the crew. As the mission warning system engineer, I immediately saw the indication of the master alarm. At the same time, the crew was hearing the alarm tone and viewing the two amber alarm lights on either side of the control panel. Simultaneously, among the panel of 40 lights at the upper center of this picture, other specific warnings illuminated, one of which was the main bus DC undervolt light. 
Even though the warning system was the first to alert the crew and mission control to the problem, my concern was that the problem was actually a malfunction of my system. No way, I thought, could so many alarms be occurring in so short a time. It had to be my system malfunctioning. Minutes later, I found that I was altogether wrong in my thinking. The warning system had performed as it should have. I carefully studied the flight plan, hoping to find a routine master alarm listed for this time. These types resulted from events like the normal shutting down or activation of a spacecraft component. For example, a routine urine dump into space might cause a higher flow rate of oxygen into the cabin, and this might cause the O2 flow high warning to trigger a master alarm but there were no such routine alarms entered in my flight plan. I knew this because I was the one who had written these into Apollo 13 crew's checklist. What we were seeing were actual real alarms. We had very grave problems. This picture was taken by a telescope from the manned spacecraft center at the moment Apollo 13 exploded. It's remarkable because this was the first time a telescope and a picture had been taken of one of our Apollo missions. It's interesting, but Jules Verne had written a novel in the 1860s called From the Earth to the Moon and it featured a similar idea, that is, a telescope watching the journey. This is a picture of the position of oxygen tank 2 in the upper photo and oxygen tank 1, which is toward the center of the vehicle. A hydrogen tank is beneath both of those oxygen tanks. Had the O2 tank number one positioned near the center of the service module exploded, likely the explosion would have been fatal. Why? Because both tanks plus the H2 tanks likely would have detonated, making the damage a magnitude larger. Also, hydrogen is quite flammable in the presence of oxygen when a spark is present. Being on the outer perimeter, the O2 Tank 2's involvement acted like a cork blowing off a soda bottle into the vacuumous space. This picture shows the architecture that took Americans to the moon. It was called the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous Design. It included two vehicles. The assemblage would travel to the vicinity of the moon then the lunar lander would separate and land. This particular approach shows why, where the explosion happened and when it happened was responsible for the crew having a fighting chance of surviving because the lunar lander was still attached. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, LEM still attached, the LEM spacecraft's good, so if we need uh, to get back home, we got a LEM to do a good portion of it with. The lunar lander was just as much a lifeboat as any of those that helped save those passengers on the Titanic tragedy. But like the Titanic, the question was, were there too many passengers for the available lifeboats and their capacity. Mission control and the interior of the command module and the lunar lander, the LEM, became as much an emergency room ER as any made for TV series ever depicted. The distance depicted here is approximately 250,000 miles. The farthest man has ever ventured into space, farther than any of the previous or remaining Apollo manned missions. <laughs>
and on this record setting distance came the only instance where an emergency made man's return to earth doubtful. Though a cult of conspiracy buffs continues to claim we never went to the moon, and others claim extraterrestrials were responsible for the rescue of Apollo 13, I agree with the initials UFO above, that is, the utmost father over us, the one who answered worldwide prayer according to scripture. Isaiah 65, 24 says, I will hear even before they call and answer while they are yet speaking. Perhaps the most appropriate headline of the week is shown here above. For it seemed that a grave in space was prepared for Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert. And how grave was the situation? A movie called Maroon was showing that week in the NASA area theater. It exactly portrayed how grave the situation was. Watch this clip from the movie about the same problem Apollo 13 faced. The potential of too little oxygen for three men in a two-man ship. that trim data on oxygen consumption in the spacecraft? As of now, they're going to live another 42 hours, plus or minus 2%. Well, that takes us up to 10.30 Monday night. And you don't have that oxygen to spare. Therefore, we'd like to suggest that you go into low tide mode, lower your oxygen pressure to 3.5, execute a full emergency power down, and those among the NASA rescue team who saw the movie that week heard this sobering conclusion to show how extremely grave the future for the Apollo 13 crew might be. Well, it's going to have to go. I mean, uh, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? One of us goes and the other two stay. But what, what are we going to do? In fact, the movie's advertisement showed that one of the astronauts did go. Pretended to EVA to fix the engine, he opened his helmet giving up his life for his fellow crewmen. Would this be the fate of one or more of Apollo 13's crew? Though probably most of you don't speak Italian, the headline is obvious, even without a translator. Para was that which faced Apollo 13. Such news headlines appeared around the world in every land, people, and tongue. President John Kennedy knew the space race was won against the time it would take Soviets to reach the moon. But this race for the rescue of Apollo 13 was against time measured in hours and days rather than years and decades. Though Apollo 13's chief flight controller Gene Krantz never said these words, all who encountered him that we could see it and hear it and know it was Gene's motto, his creed, his prayer. These were America's men, Uncle Sam's citizens, sent forth by one nation under God, a nation whose prayers for Apollo 13 affirmed what its money said, in God we trust. For the moon program, had begun with prayer back in 1961 with those words, Godspeed John Glenn, a derivative of the Bible scripture, 3 John 2, that God prosper and keep one in good health. 
for such a time as this, it seemed that petition was ordained that Apollo 13's crew succeed and remain not only in good health, but alive. In Godspeed, John Glenn. And had President John Kennedy concluded in his Rice Stadium moon race speech, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure of all time. Surely the power of that invocation voice that September 12th of 1962 was being called forth from the heavenlies for Jim Lovell and his crew this day. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. So that in stadiums, public buildings, and financial institutions, comedians like Milton Berle at Wrigley Field in Chicago, along with Chicago Board of Trade brokers as well as school teachers, launched a virtual explosion of prayer for Apollo 13. If I may be serious for one moment and ask the entire audience for a moment of prayer for the crewmen of the Apollo 13. We'll hold silence for a moment, please. Pastor, priest, and rabbi, joined with parent, child, and citizen, interceding throughout the land. From the Vatican, for this was the mission called Apollo 13 when the whole world prayed yes from the wailing wall to Wall Street voices lifted heavenward for God's intervention in behalf of the Apollo 13 astronauts. But prayer was having its way as the Bible promises that casting your bread upon the waters will not return without benefit, whether on the oceans of earth or space. And here's how, beginning with the miracle of the hatch that would not close. There was a flight controller at the seat of mission control, a man who believed in prayer. And at the moment of the explosion, he exercised his faith and began to pray in earnest that no act of ignorance about the situation would prove fatal to the crew. Yet, the crew was about to make a grave error, not knowing the cause of the explosion. Like a submarine crew who wrongly thought they had been struck by a space torpedo, that is a meteoroid, the crew thought the thud-like sound of the O2 tank's explosion was a penetration of their vessel by a meteoroid. But finding no hole in the mothership, they attempted to close the hatch to the lunar lander, which would be their rescue ship to conserve oxygen. The wrong thing to do. But prayer was answered. That expertly designed and tested hatch could not be made to close. A definite answer to the flight controller's Having benefited by a hatch that could not be made to close, the astronauts faced another dilemma regarding their ability to navigate their ship. Since the age of Columbus, mariners on the oceans of Earth and space 
must have a means of accurate navigation. This science or art of wayfinding uses concepts of time and space. For example, we know at morning time east is where the sun rises and likewise at evening time west where the sun sets so that simply knowing the time of day and position of the sun is a rudimentary means of navigation. Astronauts use more precise heavenly markers than the sun. Their guides are distant stars whose position is a defined point in space. These accurately determine a spaceship's position in time and space. But what if stars are not visible to spacefarers? Such was Apollo 13's dilemma. The problem was, when Commander James Lovell, shown here, attempted to sight a star through his space sextant, he saw only the refuse from the exploded oxygen tank and was unable to sight a star marker to navigate home. So that not having the ability to make a course correction with use of the stars was a matter of life and death. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Nevertheless, an act of providence had been at work for several years. Lovell had been the navigator of the historic Apollo 8 mission, which orbited the first men from Earth around the moon on Christmas Eve of 1968. On that occasion, the three crewmen had read from the book of Genesis, the story of creation. Following the reading of the creation story from Genesis in the Bible, Lovell prepared to navigate Apollo 8's course back to Earth. Obtaining the star coordinates after looking through Apollo 8 sextant, Lovell initiated their numeric entry into the onboard computer keyboard. But he struck the wrong key, erasing previous entries of star coordinates. Or what should he do now, having made such an error? Unknown to all, this inadvertent erasure was fortuitous. Here's why. Months before, a friend of mine who was responsible for space navigational software at the TRW Corporation was having lunch in the company cafeteria. The thought came to him, what if astronauts could not sight stars? How then could they navigate in space? At once came the answer into his mind. They could use the sun, the moon, and the earth's position. He spoke to this thought. But what would be precise enough using that procedure? And immediately came an answering response. Well then use the earth's terminator for precision as well. Returning to the office, he worked through the math and was able to convince Mission Control's navigators to deposit the program into the facility's computers, where they resided, forgotten, until Jim Lovell's erasing of the guidance platform on Apollo 8. Apollo 8, 
we have a procedure here we would like you to try out instead of redoing the star sightings. It uses the moon, the sun, and Earth's terminator. That same procedure would save the crew of Apollo 13. The headline tells the story. Carbon dioxide threatens astronauts. Here was the CO2 problem. The rescue ship, a two-man, two-day lunar lander, had round CO2 fillers. The defunct three-man, two-week mothership had plenty of now useless square CO2 filters or scrubbers. If there was a way to make those square filters work in the but no one at Johnson Space Center or the rest of the planet, in fact, had ever made a square peg fit into a round hole, But the Bible says, with God, nothing shall be impossible to you. Even making square pegs fit into round barrels. Congress had urged by proclamation that churches be called to prayer 24 hours after the explosion. And that's exactly what a small Texas church was doing at the request of their pastor. One of that flock reported this amazing incident. Not knowing that the NASA rescue team was challenged that evening with this filter problem, the woman's eyes were closed as she petitioned God for intervention in behalf of Apollo 13. Suddenly, a scene appeared in the vision of her mind. It was a barnyard with farmers who were tending their pigs. As she continued to pray, the farmers had a problem. Rather than herding the swine into the barn, they were pushing one of the hogs into a barrel and it simply wouldn't fit. No amount of shoving seemed to help despite application of grease and other inventions. Confused by how this related to Apollo 13, she simply prayed on Lord Jesus. Whatever this refers to, make those pigs fit into that barrel for the NASA people involved. About that time, at the Space Center, or shortly thereafter, the technicians laid out on a table plastic moon rock bags, cardboard from the log books, suit hoses, the things they knew were on board of Powell 13. And one of the workers saw a scene in his mind. Oh, not of pigs and barrels, but of those square CO2 filters and the articles on the table. He saw a configuration that wouldn't need the bear. After all, with God, all things are possible. And here is what he saw after it was called up to the crew and they constructed it. And what made it work? Duct tape. Don't ever be without it. God can use it to work miracles in your behalf as well. The New York Times headline that power failure imperils astronauts was wholly accurate and here's why. It seemed that the reentry power reserves were inadequate for reentry. The ultimate course would be a fiery death during descent to Earth. Let's review once more that initial miracle about that hatch that wouldn't close. And by the way, later in the mission when failure to close that hatch and seal that hatch snugly would have meant death to the crew, it worked perfectly. But despite the time saved in not having to unlatch and restow that hatch had it closed later, it seemed that 
Too much time had been used to power up the rescue ship in those initial moments when we didn't understand exactly what was happening. Because the exploded O2 tank system fed the fuel cells which produced all the electrical power of the mothership, when all the oxygen had leaked out of those tanks, the fuel cells no longer would work and produce power. The only alternative was to keep the mothership alive using the batteries in the mothership which were meant only to be used for re-entry. This was a 12 hour period at the end of the mission. Now if these batteries were depleted, the men could not survive re-entry even if they did succeed in returning to Earth. Despite that prayer of the flight controller that saved time when that hatch wouldn't work because they could immediately, as soon as we discovered the problem go into the lander, too much of the command module's re-entry capsule's battery power had been consumed and the men were going to die anyway. The comic book panels show the nature of this serious problem. In the transfer of the crew to the lander as a lifeboat, their re-entry batteries had been used to keep the mothership alive and the lander could be powered up. Unfortunately, too much of that re-entry power had been used. But again, an unseen hand seemed to be guiding events. Like the vision of pigs that woman had, another unusual circumstance occurred which only prayer can explain. There was a movie showing at theaters around Houston that week. It, it at first appeared in January at the plush Windsor Theater on Richmond Avenue in Houston. But not many manned spacecraft center NASA workers saw it there because the Windsor featured a huge Cinerama screen and a similar ticket price at that time of $3.50 a person. Now remember, Apollo 13 happened more than three decades ago. In those days, I know from experience, NASA workers had what we called a NASA night out. This included taking your wife to a neighborhood theater like the Gulf Gate at a ticket price of only $1.25 each, and then you might use a dinner coupon for two at Monterey House which is a Tex-Mex restaurant in our area and then you'd conclude the evening of NASA night out by filling up with gas at the Utotem where if you filled up you got a free cup of coffee. Now that was NASA night out. Well by April 13th of 1970 the night of the explosion the movie Marooned about astronauts stranded in space was at the Gulf Gate Theater near NASA and many of those who worked on the rescue of Apollo 13 were enjoying a NASA night out watching it. The movie paralleled many problems faced by Apollo 13 one of which was an electrical power shortage. The man responsible for the electrical power system, Art Campus, seen behind me in the right corner of this picture, had just returned from the movie and gone to bed when Mission Control called about the problem. Quickly he dressed and drove to the Space Center. As he drove to the Manned Spacecraft Center, like that woman whose mind envisioned those pigs, Art had a thought in his mind. Of all things, he thought about jumper cables. The batteries in the rescue ship had lots of power. If somehow you could jumper some of it to those depleted re-entry capsule batteries, the crew could be saved. He vaguely recalled writing a procedure for such an eventuality months ago, but the question was about those jumper cables. Was there a wire? between the two ships electrical system through which a trickle charge could be applied. 
like that team of men who had made those square filters work in the round barrel, Art and his team unfolded the integrated schematic drawings of the two vehicles on, on a table. They found a single thin wire between the two vehicles that had been included in the design more than five years before for an altogether different purpose. The following video clip shows Art and his team working in the mission evaluation room to find that single thread holding the astronauts' lives in the balance. These were the systems experts the narrator speaks of. Art was one of them who God used greatly. first problem was solved. They were back on the path to Earth. But there were many other problems to be solved. From a building at Houston's Manned Spacecraft Center, systems experts coordinated the coast-to-coast -coast effort to get the crew back. But when they tried our jumper cable, jump charge, out on the power profile computer simulation, the data said don't do it. It's not safe. But there was no other alternative but to do it. And it worked. God had outsmarted the computer. Somehow he had stored the means of escape in Art's mind because a later search of Art's and NASA's files failed to find the procedure that Art had recalled preparing months before. Yet that night, he had precisely written it down, step by step, as soon as he arrived at the Space Center. Watch this brief video clip from the movie Marooned. Art had seen this clip just moments before being asked to solve the weak battery problem. It's no wonder that the idea of charging the batteries with a jumper charge came to mind after seeing it. Obviously, God was whispering into the power manager's mind how to save the Apollo 13 crew. Shut down number two and three fuel cells. We'll leave number one on the line in case we have to charge the batteries. All right, two. Did you hear that last comment? in case we have to charge the batteries. Yes, God was at work giving Art the answer at the exact time Apollo 13 exploded and depleted its batteries. Now appeared the final and most ominous threat to the crew of Apollo 13's lives. On Wednesday, after the Monday evening explosion, Hurricane Helen appeared in the Pacific, moving directly to the splashdown site. Again, the movie Marooned warned the Apollo 13 rescue team. That is, not only did the NASA theater movie Marooned warn of weak batteries, it also warned of the threat of a hurricane. Watch. What are you looking at, Sonny? A disturbance in the intertropical conversion zone. Somebody's gonna have a hurricane. No spacecraft had ever been recovered in heavy hurricane Toss seas. Regardless if those batteries were fully charged, they could not hope to keep a storm-tossed vessel designed for the ocean of space seaworthy in, a, in an ocean of salt water. The crew likely would be lost at sea should they descend into Hurricane Helen. The moment of re-entry was imminent, but first the damaged service module which housed the exploded oxygen tank too must be separated from the assemblage of the reentry capsule and rescue ship. 
Once separated, the crew of Apollo 13 could survey the damage. It revealed the extent of how prayer was answered. After the explosion, some had recommended using the large engine on the right to speed the journey back to Earth, but Gene Krantz had sensed a dread within about the engine's use, and for good reason. It appeared the nozzle had been bent slightly by the explosion. An unsymmetrical nozzle likely would have led to a fatal consequence akin to the Challenger tragedy. The sequence of re-entry required that the unaerodynamic four-legged lunar lander rescue ship be jettisoned leaving only the three-man command ship, the re-entry capsule that is. That craft with its three passengers must now face the fiery furnace of entry dynamics. By early Friday morning, the 17th of April of 1970, the retro officer responsible for selecting and adjusting the re-entry to a designated landing site was troubled. The re-entry process is summarized in this picture. But what cannot be seen are unseen forces at work which likely would take the lives of Apollo 13's crew. Earlier, the weathermen had advised the retro to move the landing site. Uncertain as what his decision should be, the retro had delayed accepting their advice. But there was an even more threatening problem. The angle of re-entry was behaving oddly. For some unexplained reason, it was shallowing, such that if correction was not made, Apollo 13's capsule would skip off the atmosphere into the oblivion of space missing the re-entry corridor altogether, a fatal consequence. A brief firing of the thrusters had been performed earlier to compensate for the drift, but there would be a point of no return when correction would be impossible if the shallowing continued. The question was first, what was causing it? And secondly, would it continue or cease? Still another threat was apparent. The gyros, responsible for steering the capsule through the re-entry corridor, had never performed very accurately an acceptance test unless they had a day to warm up. But this required electrical power which Apollo 13 could not afford to use. The result was the gyros had only been heated for a couple hours likely they would not steer the craft safely through the re-entry path. And still again, God had spoken a word of warning to the rescue team through the movie Marooned about the gyros, known as the IMUs having no heat because the heaters were turned off. Listen closely to this clip from the movie Marooned. Pull the GNN circuit breakers and the IMU heater breakers. Circuit breakers on. Did you hear it? Pull the IMU heater breakers. Circuit breakers off. A very definite foretelling from above that the IMUs, a name for the gyros, would be threatened. This was an occasion when one had to believe in the power of prayer to overcome a combination of threats. Threats which made a successful rescue of Apollo 13's crew unlikely. Network newsman Jules Bergman had ventured earlier to guess that the likelihood of the crew returning alive was one chance in ten. All had scoffed at such a pessimistic assessment until these final moments 
facing odds perhaps even greater than Bergman's that Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert would not return to Earth alive. The song, I believe, has this lyric that somewhere above the storm, the smallest prayer will still be heard. Early the morning of Friday, April 17, 1970, as Apollo 13 faced these many threats, a red-headed schoolgirl named Wanda burst into her classroom with these words. Teacher, I heard on TV before school that our astronauts might die in a storm. Wanda's 13 classmates and Wanda looked at their teacher for encouragement. How Wanda's teacher responded was later shared with me in a letter. Though at first, at a loss for words of encouragement, the teacher had a thought about another storm on a sea far away. That storm had also threatened lives of friends like these astronauts. Yes, she would share that story from the Bible about the storm on the Sea of Galilee with her children. Children, there is one who can help our friends. He's special because the Bible says of him that he's God's only son. His name is Jesus. And the Bible also says of him that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was in a boat with 12 of his friends, his disciples, when a terrible storm threatened their lives. His friends awoke him and asked for his help. Every eye was on the teacher, every ear in tune with her voice. Kids, I'm going to be praying in our quiet time in a moment that Jesus will either stop the storm or move it away and bring our friends the astronauts home safely. She watched as Wanda and every one of her classmates bowed their heads and lips began to speak silently that the one who calmed the storm 2,000 years ago would do the same this day. And why is that lyric about the smallest prayer being heard above the storm important here? These were special kids. None had an IQ above 80. Wanda's was a special education class. For them, understanding the difference between a quarter, a dime, or a penny was a difficult arithmetic problem. Nevertheless, though modest in mathematical talent, they were giants in moving the heart of God. As they prayed, the retro experienced an unspoken assurance that Hurricane Helen would not threaten Apollo 13's reentry, so that he ignored the weatherman's request and advice to change the landing site. And then, despite the shallowing of that re-entry angle, something within assured him the shallowing would cease, and he need not worry about further corrections. And something so remarkable occurred that to this day, it cannot be explained satisfactorily. Radio blackout during re-entry had always been predictable to the second. Somehow, Apollo 13's lasted an extra half minute. Perhaps it was during those 30 seconds that the smallest prayers of those 14 children were heard above the storm. Prayers that extended the hollow of the mighty hand of God. The evidence is that Apollo 13, 
despite the brief warming of the gyros, had one of the most precise landings of the entire Apollo program. And that shallowing? Well, days later, its source was discovered. The vapor given off by the rescue ship's cooling system. No other mission had to deal with that because the craft was always left on the moon. As soon as it was jettisoned, prior to re-entry, the drift ceased. There was one who did know about it in advance. He spoke to the retro that final morning at the request of Wanda and her classmates. And how did those school children react? Let me read the conclusion of the letter I received from their teacher. Well, the day moved along, much as usual. Lunch came and went, and we were in the midst of penmanship class when a fifth grader knocked and entered the room with this message. My teacher said to tell you that a POW 13 has landed safely. Oh, I thanked the little messenger, and even as he departed, my little flock, as one, had dropped their pencils and with heads reverently bowed, were thanking God for answered prayer. Penmanship class ended, and we were back at the table, striving desperately to discover the relationship between pennies and nickels, dimes, quarters, and halves. And suddenly the door opened, and a very wise sixth grader burst into our midst, and he shouted this, My teacher thought you and your kids ought to know the astronauts are out of the capsule and safe in the helicopter, heading back to the big ship. Everything is A-OK, -okay, no sweat. When he was properly thanked and had departed, little red-headed Wanda asked, Can we hold hands around the table like when we ask our noontime blessing? And can we sing the song the pilgrims brought to America. At Wanda's suggestion, we all stood, joined hands, and with bowed heads, 14 little children, all with IQs under 80, sang, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the teacher, well, her lips moved, but her voice was so choked with tears that no sound really came. <laughs>